I said uh, the other day, because we were so busy prior to this. This kind of goes along with our sermon today. Y'all notice how busy we were prior to COVID. You didn't have time to eat as family. I don't know about y'all, but we were running to practice this and, and go to that. Constantly on the go, you ate out. And might have missed some meals during the day because you just didn't have time. But God kind of paused America to where we can spend time with each other. I probably spent more time with my kids in this last three months than I have in the last two years. You know, and getting to know my children and um, getting to know how, how it was. I kind of think it must be kind of how it was 30 years ago. You know, I was young then. But when I was younger, you spent time with your family. I remember Friday used to be the day that you stayed home and watched at TGIF. Friday. Who remembers that? Y'all remember? Nobody went anywhere on Friday. You stayed home and ordered pizza and you watched pizza. Full House and all those little shows. Um, I don't know what it is. and Or did whatever you did. But everybody stayed home and it all culminated with 2020. And you made sure I went to bed before that because it used to creep me out when I was a kid. But we watched Guns, Guns, you were like mom and daddy. Cole's like old man. All Cole watches is Andy Griffith, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We watched through the whole series, every episode, within a month, and then he starts back over. So it'll be color for about a week, and the next week he's back to black and white, and he's back to color. I'm like, Jesus, Cole, between him and you. But God has kind of paused um, our country. God has paused the church. I think the church is getting a new appreciation of church. We took it for granted. We got lazy. As church people, I believe we got lazy. We got complacent. Um, it, became, it was about us and not about our call. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be in Ezra. I'll go ahead and get that out to you now so you have time to look at the recordings to find the page number. Ezra, one of the, the minor prophets, and we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, rebuilding the house of God. Rebuilding the house of God. Because today we find ourselves in a time where we are rebuilding church. How many times in your lifetime have you ever heard a pastor stand up and say, we're trying to figure out when to have Sunday school? We're trying to figure out how to restructure our children's program. And if we get caught up in the negative narrative, we can look at this situation as something that's bad. But I think what we have to look at it is God is using the church today to look more like God wants the church to look. Because if you look over history, church has changed. Who believes church has changed? I can actually see hands today. Church has changed, haven't it? And we have been sold a lie by the world. That church has to incorporate the work. Does that mean that we're still going to do some of the things? Yes. But if you go in some churches across America, certain of these big churches, if you go in and see their services, it looks like a nightclub. You couldn't tell it apart from any other thing going on. I'm not saying that we have to be so strict and so morally straight that, that, that we're boring and staunch. But what we're trying to say is we should look different. And it should be about the gospel. There's sermons being preached across the country that's been preached over the last year that's coming out of the Reader's Digest. Yeah. A lot of these sermons that you see on television, they don't even read scripture. They just stand up and give you a self-motivation speech, a pep talk, and send you on your way. And church has not been being operated the way God wanted church to operate. Our churches have begun to depend on programs. Everybody wants to tell us that in order to have a church, you've got to have a program. Well, I'm going to tell you today, if we, if we base our church life on a program, we won't have church. Because there's no program that fits into COVID. And at the end of the day, we can get down on ourselves and say, why did God put us here? And you're going to kind of question why God's allowed this to happen. I'm going to tell you why God allowed this to happen. Because just like Israel faced captivity... In order for God to rebuild the church, we're facing this captivity today so that God can rebuild us into something that is more like what church should be. Because we've messed it up. We've allowed religion to dictate what we do. You ever, y'all ever been a victim to religion? 
You know, people are dying going to hell today because religion lets you down. And we've all been taught that this is how the church is supposed to look. But then you look in here, which is supposed to be the standard of the way we live. You begin to look in the Bible, look at Acts, look at Romans. The church of today looks nothing like the church of then. And why would God tell us how the church of then looked if it's not supposed to be how we operate and how we function? So God has placed us in a specific place and time to impact people for Christ that no other generation is going to be able to do. I honestly believe that God is calling a, a, a worldwide revival through these situations. God is placing people in a time today that they'll listen to you talk about the gospel. Because everything has been taken away from them. we got people riding on the streets. we got a civil dis disorder rampant in our country on top of a disease that is supposed to be ravishing all the world. Uh, economic systems have been shut down. People are losing their jobs. If there's no time for us to sell hope today, when are we ever going to need to sell hope? And I think when we begin to look at the correlation between Ezra's time and the captivity of the Babylonians on Israel... I think we can see us. We're going to see us through this. And that's what I'm going to talk about today because God used captivity to humble Israel. See, the problem that Israel ran into, Israel was supposed to be God's children. When they made that covenant with Abraham, you know, God just didn't make the covenant. Everybody gets caught in their mind that God was the only one that signed on the dotted line. But Abraham was re required also to sign that covenant. Meaning that God's going to protect his children, but his children have to acknowledge him as God. Well, Israel got complacent. Israel got fat and happy. Have we all been there in churches? I know I got fat and happy in the air conditioning. And I truly didn't appreciate being in here until I had to preach in the parking lot. And even though that worked, and that's what God wanted us to do, it still didn't make it any easier to do what we did. And see, Israel got complacent in their service to God. See, Israel's problem was when, when Israel became a nation, remember God told them, y'all can't let the world see me. You can't begin to marry these other religions and let these religions see me into the way you do things. So Israel, essentially what they started doing is opening their door to other religions. And then they would allow those other religions' practices to seep into the church. Sound familiar? Yeah. How many churches across this world are taking worldly things and incorporating them in the church? I had a friend tell me not long back that she went to a Christmas play last, last year. And in the middle of the play, Santa Claus drove in in a golf cart with Olaf from Frozen handing out candy canes. Wasn't no mention of Jesus. Wasn't no mention of the cross. It was just a Disney on ice set in the stage of church. Taking the world to appease those in the church. Israel was beginning to get caught up in this idea of it's okay to let a little bit of the world dictate how we serve God. Sound familiar? We've had the world tell us that programs save the church. How many churches you seen saved by programs? I went to the Baptist Corporation not long back to one of our meetings up there. And, and when we were talking about this, everybody says, okay, well, programs are gone. And I said, well, what y'all understand is programs are designed for huge churches. In my church, we can't implement the programs you have because we don't have enough people to implement the programs. We don't have enough capital to implement the programs. So programs are not saving churches. That's a misnomer that we are taught that this program is going to magically change the way we do church. It's not. Because it ain't about a program. It's about a relationship with God. And Israel walked away from their relationship with God in search of what the world said they should look like. Do you not believe that the world is about to tell you what you need to believe? They're telling you what you need to believe now. They're protesting and, and rioting in streets, dictating your belief. Now that is wrong what happened in Minnesota. Nobody has said otherwise. Nobody is going to say that that was not murder. Those people are being punished. Nobody says that it is not right. It is okay to peacefully protest. If you want to peacefully protest in our country, you have every right to do that. Nobody is saying that. 
The problem I have is when our government begins to try to tell us what we're going to believe. And the next step is they're going to tell you you can't assemble together because of COVID. They tried that already. And good thing we had somebody in the White House that basically stood up and said this, I don't care what you say. That's going to throw away the one we're talking about today. We're going to have church because a church is a necessity. But if we let the world dictate how we worship, then we become worldly. And the church has become worldly. We've got people that want to come to church, sit on the pew, have programs, not take part of the programs, and not support the programs, go home, live their everyday life, they've appeased their, their sense of morality, and they've shown up to church, and nothing changes. You know how many lost people are in this world that believe they're Christian and they're not saved? You might say, how do you know that? There's no fruit there. And Israel fell victim to this. Israel began to let the world seep in. And then they began to change the way they view things. They didn't view things through the God's eyes. They viewed it through the world's eyes. And churches across this country that have the prosperity movement is taking over. Scary thing. I'm going to ask you to do some Wednesday night Bible studies on some of these movements that are, that are happening in churches. We got the Calvinistic movement that's taking over in the churches. Predestination. God chose you before the foundation of the world that you're saved here regardless of what the decision you make. That ain't in my Bible. The word of faith movement. They, there's progressive movement. The progressive believe that only portions of the Bible are accurate and true. If I can't believe this is all true, I ain't going to believe any of it's true. But if they can convince the people that parts aren't true, then they can convince the people that God is not true. They do not believe that God died on the cross. They also believe that, that it was too violent. Yeah. That God didn't kill Jesus. If he did, that's child abuse. So God can't be served. Y'all don't know. There's some crazy stuff being preached on television across this country. Crazy, crazy stuff. We're going to be doing some talks on that. I'm going to also be talking about Bethel music. Bethel music is no longer be sung in this church. And Hillsong is no longer be sung in this church. And I'll explain that why. And then after I tell you why, you'll understand fully. Is heresy. The church is heresy. That church is heresy on top of heresy. And they're using popular music. And what you're singing to ain't what you think you're singing to. So we're going to be talking about some of that. I'm not against secular. I'm not against contemporary music. But I'm against contemporary music when it supports the church that's doing terror car readings in their worship service and being close to the Spirit of God. When they're laying on graves thinking they can absorb the Holy Spirit from other people that have died and and went into the grave. Y'all don't know what's out there, but I'm going to educate you on that later. So, that's coming. We have allowed this to seep in. So, you know what God's done? Press pause. When Israel got too far away from God and, and the leaders that God put in place, the Levites, the priests, and the leaders began to allow this to happen, and God told them through Jeremiah, if you don't stop, guess what? I got to press pause. I'm going to take away what you have so you can appreciate it what you have. Sound familiar? God pressed pause on this nation. He paused us. He no longer allowed us to do church like we used to do church. Why? Because you know nothing happens in this world that God does not control. God controls COVID. God controls Trump. God controls China. God controls it all. We're going to read that in just a second. Nothing happens independently of who God is. So if nothing happens independently of who God is, why did God allow COVID? Have you ever asked that question during this time? Honestly, I asked that question. That's why God gave me this scripture for us to read today. And God said this, I have to place my church into captivity so that I can get my people back to where I need them to be. And God has now placed our churches and placed our people in captivity in order to move us now Back to where God wants us to be. To the new normal. What y'all trying to hear now? I'm so sick of the new normal. In church, it ain't never been but one normal. And it ain't never going to be but one normal. And that's the word of God preached to those that are lost so that they come to the, real, the, the, the knowledge of who Christ is and come to be saved. We've changed that. We've changed that. We don't want to be bold for God anymore. So you know what God said? Since you want to be lazy, I'm going to make you work for your religion now. 
And right now, we are having to work if we are going to be called children of God. Who has found that you are having to take more time personally to see Christ than you ever have? Because no longer is a Sunday school teacher dictating to you what you're going to learn that week. Now you have to take it upon yourself to grow the relationship with God. So God has placed us in a situation to humble us so that he can now call us to rebuild the church in his image. Because we have made church our image. Ezra 1, verse 1. We're going to read down through chapter 2. It's only about 11 verses. Y'all stand and read the word of God. I haven't been able to tell y'all to do that in a while. Y'all stand up. Stand up with me. All right, this is what it says. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit against of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia. I want you all to pay attention here. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build up him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, we are talking about Cyrus of Persia, a pagan king. Now, if you look at the wording there, you're about to think that he was belonging to God, right? He didn't know who God was. He was a pantheist. He served many gods. But God stirred up the spirit of a pagan king to deliver his people. Remember that. Whoever there is among you of all his people, be God. May his God be with him. Let him go to Israel, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever price he may leave, live, let the man of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites rose. Even everyone whose spirit God stirred up to go and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All those of them about them encouraged him with articles of silver, with gold, with goods of cattle, with valuables, aside from all that was given as a free will offering. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put it in the house of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithraim, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheshavar, the prince of Judah. Listen to this. Now, this was their number. Thirty gold dishes, a thousand silver dishes, twenty-nine duplicates, thirty gold bowls, 410 silver bowls of the second kind, and a thousand other articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Sheshavar brought them all out with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Dear Heavenly Father God, help us to hear you. Pray, Lord, that your spirit will fall in this place, God, as we recalibrate where we stand with you. In your precious and powerful name, I pray, God. Amen. So we see that the rebuilding of the house of God, it starts with a preparation and a pursuit. It starts with us having to do something. But in this case, the preparation of rebuilding the house of God started a little different, didn't it? Because God sets the climate. God says the climate that we live in. I think sometimes as Christians we fail to realize that God is in control no matter what loading we have in the White House, no matter who sits on the Senate and the House of Representatives, no matter who is our governor, who is our mayor. God sets the orders of this world. COVID did not happen except God let it happen. God's going to deliver us from that because God chooses to deliver us from that. God put Israel into Babylonian captivity to humble his people. And then when his people were right, God did what? Called his people back. But the funny thing is, God used who? Cyrus, a pagan king, king of Persia, the king of Babylon. If you remember when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem the first time, he tore down the temple, he carried the people off, right? Nebuchadnezzar took who? 
Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. That's a story that he had incorporated them into Babylonian captivity. So they had been in captivity for 70 years. Jeremiah had predicted that they would one day be released. They had been in there so long that many historians believe the people got complacent and basically said, God has forgot us. You had some that were humbling themselves before God, trying to get back to where they were, but you had others that just assimilated themselves into Babylonian lifestyle. Everything continued as it was. But God had a different plan. Because God knew where his people were. And you know, sometimes as Christians, we get this idea that the situations we face in our lives, the situations politically in this country, we have no control over. But the God that we serve does. And the God that we serve says, what? Those are my people. I am going to protect them. I am going to watch out for them. God used a pagan king. Did you see how he spoke? If I took out King Cyrus and the names and just said, someone said this, what would you say that person was? I had to be a Christian. Said the Spirit of God began to what? Turn up inside of Cyrus to let his people go. And he says to rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem. It didn't start with the people begging. It started with God moving. Our country today is facing a time where God is rebuilding our churches. It is not going to start with us doing anything. It's going to be started with God moving in the world. And God has already begun to move. Look at the situation we find ourselves in today. God has prepared us. I laughed at Cole the other day when all the riots. Cole had a hard time understanding riots. Because we've never, our house does not look at your racial determination to determine who you are as a person. We never function like this. Cole's never been raised like that. And he said, Dad, I don't understand it. He said, this world's just coming to an end. I said, son, I said, son it, it, it is because that's biblical. And then I laughed. He goes, first it was COVID. Then it was tornadoes. Because you know, we had a week of tornadoes in the middle of it. He said, and then, now we all fight each other. I said, son, God is calling his people to stand up. Because we can no longer be who we used to be and live in today's society. Because if we are, then we are going to be like those people of Israel that decided to stay in Babylon because it was too hard to fight to rebuild the kingdom. And we got people in churches today we got churches across counties in, in South Carolina that are making the decision today, do we just kind of go by the wayside because it's too, too hard to fight to be a church? We have been blessed. Guys, we have been blessed through this process. The deacons we meet every week, and we continually go back to the fact that God has blessed our church. Financially, we are blessed. Other churches are falling apart. They can't keep the doors open. We haven't missed a beat. Our numbers haven't, been, haven't changed. I had a news station call me to ask us to be on the news. We didn't call them. They called us. God has blessed our church and put us in a position that now he is calling us, setting the climate for us, that we're either going to step forward for God, we're either going to be better Christians than we were when we went into this, or we're going to go back to being who we were. We're either going to be happy with the world system in Babylon, or we're going to now do what? Seek God. And it's going to take work. Functioning in today's society is not going to be easy. But it can be done. Because God called his people to a pagan king. Let that sink in. That would be like God calling his people to Nancy Pelosi. I probably just got banned from Facebook. But if you believe that woman's got any sense, you in trouble. Could you imagine God? Well, I guess God used a donkey. He can use anything to get his message across. But at the end of the day, we get so caught up in what God can't do. This world's too lost. Have you ever heard this? This world's just too lost for God. No, it's not. God placed us in captivity. Why? Because he's going to show us who he is. Only my God can take a pagan and deliver his people. And not only is it about the call that we're going to have, but it's the, or the climate that we're in, God dictates the call. I think sometimes as Christians we forget that God dictates our call. And many of us have got satisfied 
we're where we are. You know, there's many Christians that get satisfied with just sitting in a pew. Anybody, when we take spiritual gift inventories, did y'all ever see that, that category that said that it says pew sitter? My spiritual gift is sitting on a pew. Did y'all see any of that in there? Whose spiritual gift is pew sitting? It ain't in there, right? Then you know, put your hand down. Because God called us to work. But we have become so dependent on programs to educate our children. Depending on programs to educate our teenagers. Depending on programs to educating us. We could drop our kids off and somebody would teach them the word of God. But now God is saying, no, no, no. I gave you a spiritual gift and now you have to lead your household. And now I'm going to call you to lead this community. I'm calling you back, but I'm going to call you back differently. In this new society, God is calling out those Christians that don't really want it. You know when that happens, Cole's already started practicing football together. So they've been wearing, practicing social distancing and all that. So don't be concerned. I'm, I'm clean. The other day we went out last Saturday, 11 o'clock. Y'all remember Saturday was about 90 degrees and about 85% humidity. Y'all remember correctly. They had them out running. And you know what they found out after about 45 minutes? They found out who wanted it. Because they all trying to make a roster on the travel team. They found out who wanted it. Halfway through, some of them sitting in the shade, they found out who wanted to be on the field. God has put us in the heat in this country to find out what Christians wanted. Which ones are going to be called by God and live up to that call? And God called his people back. And what's funny is, the people who messed up was the first people who God called back. Do y'all see that? He called the Levites. The Levites, originally, the Levites and the leaders of Israel let that stuff happen. And they caused the downfall of the whole country. So when God started to change things, not only did he use the heart of a pagan, but then what did he do? He took the one that had already messed up to begin to rebuild. He gave them a second chance. So I don't care what you did prior to COVID. God is calling you today to be different. He said you might have messed up in your service before. But guess what? I press pause. So I can change and dictate when you go back to doing what you called to do. We might not have been the best Christians prior to that. We might not have been the best Christians prior to COVID. Have all y'all always been perfect Christians? I ain't always the best Christian. I ain't always the perfect Christian. But at the end of the day, God is giving us a second chance through this calling to be something better. To educate our children at home. I'm worried about the children of our church. I, I, I'm, I'm desperately worried about the children of our church. I'm worried about our teenagers. Look around in here today. How many teenagers you see in here? You want to ask me how many I saw in first service? You know how many's probably been coming the whole time regularly? Two or three. Youth group of twenty. I'm worried about our youth. I'm worried about our children. We have to answer the call to step up and work. We are being called in this country now to work hard. Israel was called to work hard. Who would want to leave your cushy job in Babylonia? Where you were doing whatever you wanted to do. To go back to Jerusalem. And build a temple. Do you think they had a long line of people standing up to do that? But God calls the quality. You might not have quantity. But you get the quality. And that call is there for Ezra and the people. who said what? Guys, I'm going to stir up their hearts. And what's funny is. The leaders just got up one day and said. God's called us. And God has called us. We've got to move forward. And the last thing that I want us to see is this. God builds the church. I think we forgot that. We always want to say that we build the church. We don't have nothing to do with building the church. I will tell you, when I thought about doing a drive-in service, I thought that was the dumbest thing I ever thought of in my life. I said, we'll have three people show up, but I'm going to throw one down the middle just to see if somebody sways. Ye of little faith. Because I don't build the church. I take a part in it through my calling. But it ain't up to me. 
It's up to me to be faithful in my service to the church. And then let God handle the rest. We've been too hard and too pressed to try to force our things and force what we want. But God's going to handle it. Here in this situation, not only did God use a pagan king, not only did God call the losers that let them get there in the first place, but what else did he do? The last thing he did is he provided. Didn't he build the church? Cyrus said, look, we got a money. Y'all, whoever lives near these people, if your next door neighbor is going back to build the house of God, give him some cattle, give him some money, give him some silver. He called up the treasurer and said, hey, can you look through there and find where Nebuchadnezzar stole those things from these people many years ago, those sacred artifacts of gold? Now, we ain't talking about wood and sticks and stubble. We're talking about gold and silver. Go get those things, and if you look at how Solomon built the temple, this is 24 karat gold. This is the good stuff. Go get them things that they stole from them and give it back to them. And let them take it to rebuild their kingdom. So not only did God use a foreign king, God did funded it. And we won't walk by faith in churches. God said, I will build the church. I will call the people. And I will use people that you never thought would be used for the glory of my kingdom. Amen. We look at programs and we do that. We can't fund that. We look at ministry and we can't fund that. My God can fund anything. My God took a bunch of broke Israelites and sent them to rebuild a temple and then gave them back all they sacrificed. Y'all see that, right? We've all lost something during COVID. But whatever we lost during COVID, God is going to give us back tenfold. Do you believe that? I believe our church is going to come through this strong. Who feels like your, your relationship with God is strong, stronger through this time? Because I'm going to tell y'all, there were some days that your pastor, who was supposed to be the spiritual leader of your church, I had some bad days. When your job calls you and tells you you're no longer employed there, and then your unemployment, you make too much money to apply for unemployment. See, a lot of y'all didn't know all this was going on. And then I call her unemployment, and the lady tells me, if you want unemployment, just get rid of your church. Stop preaching at your church, and we'll give you unemployment. $1,000 a week. And then not only that, then Satan decided that he was going to set it up so I got unemployment every week. But I couldn't spend it. And they won't let me send it back. I still have it. I've been calling them every week to try to send it back. They won't let me send it back, but I can't use it. So through this whole situation, there was times where you know what I thought? God, why are we even doing this? Church is done. We can't gather together. We out meeting in the parking lot. I felt like I was preaching at the Ford dealership every week. <laughs> it's hot. Our people, we can't even talk to each other anymore. There ain't no fellowship. I said, God, you know, and your word says do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. And we ain't, we, we in the parking lot together, but we ain't together. And I got discouraged. But in that time, you know what God said? Blake, I'm going to build a church. It don't matter where they're at. It don't matter where they're doing now. I'm going to build the church. And when I build it, I'm going to build it with stronger material than I build it with originally. Because the people are going to get stronger. Who appreciates church now? Who thinks that you didn't appreciate it before? I didn't appreciate it before. I didn't appreciate the air conditioned building. I didn't appreciate an audience I could look at that I ain't preaching to Dylan. I'm going to get Dylan saved before the end of these tapes is done. Because if you go in the office with me and Dylan, we're literally five foot apart. If me or Dylan have COVID, we both got it. And when I'm yelling at y'all, I'm about five foot from Dylan's face and he's going. <laughs> But God is still moving. Because God builds the church. Did the Israelites do anything? Did they? They faithfully walked. That's what Israel did. They heard the call. God knows what the climate is in our country. God knows what the climate is in Maple Cane Baptist Church. God knows what the climate is in your house. 
God knows you might be fixing to kill your husband because y'all have been locked up too much together. Or you're going to knock your wife in the head because you've been locked up in the house together for too long. Or you're about to not have no kids because you're going to turn loose in the yard and tell them to go through their own thing. We know everybody's been pushed to the limit. But at the end of the day, God knows the climate at your house. God knows the climate from April came back to church. And God is right now, through these words, calling you guys back to service. God right now is calling you guys to prepare. Because we got to rebuild the church. But we ain't going to do the work. God's going to do the work. we just going to be faithful to walk. True? What did they walk? What was their job? They had to swing a hammer and walk. We have to be faithful in the job that God is giving you, and God is going to build this church. I think we are on the precipice of doing great things in this church. Great things. Do you know how many churches in this area shut their doors? We were getting church people from other churches because their church was offering them nothing. They rolled over, gave up, and died. Or their facilities couldn't accommodate what they were you know, accommodate doing anything. But what did God do for Maple King Baptist Church through this time? Bless us. Have we ever made a deal? Y'all know why I'm not preaching a sermon on there, right? They cut all that out because they didn't want to hear what I had to say. But at the end of the day, God still did that. It wasn't us. What do we do? What did I do? I stood out there on concrete pad and preached. Now last week I thought I was going to eat my, my dog, but <laughs> ain't too much going on, you know? You guys sat in the car and playing and blue flies and, and mosquitoes, but God still added to the number, right? Man. There was times we had 140 people sitting in the parking lot listening to the Word of God in the summer. It ain't about us. It ain't about what we do. It's about how faithful we are to God's calling. And just like God restored Israel, even though they had made mistakes, God's going to restore us. And God's going to make us better. We're going to look different because we're going to see a couple chapters over when we start looking at the temple. This temple wasn't as pretty as that temple that Solomon built, but it functioned better. And we might not be as pretty as we used to be when all this is said and done. We might not have all these little boxes that we put ministries in where we can say we can do this. It might look like a jumble mess of kids running in the yard and standing on polka dots and we can get education to the end. It might be us living in classes all spread out in small groups, which is how the church started. It might all turn into that. It might not be as pretty as it used to be, but I believe it's going to function now. Because starting to rebuild the church of God starts by first understanding that God controls the climate, knowing that God is on the issue call. And knowing that God is going to build the church. And that's what we have to hold on to. So what do we take from that? Next week we're going to be talking about a different portion of this. Of how we're going to rebuild this church. What can you do? Simple. Answer the call. I'm going to tell you something, guys. God is about to call some of you to make some big changes in the way that you've been doing church. God is fixing to ask some of you to step up, do some things you ain't comfortable doing, that you ain't never done before. Don't close your eyes, Christy. It'll be all right. <laughs> Christy's already praying. Take this cup from me. God is fixing to ask you to be more committed to the ministries of this church. We're going to have to work harder. But just know that when we answer that call faithfully, God is going to build the church. And it's not going to be on the pretense of getting together and drinking Kool-Aid and eating cookies and having socials. We all miss that. But it's going to be about winning the lost at any cost. The church has forgot that. We're here to serve the lost. And God has hit pause so that we can get our jump ready. So that now when we get back in here, God can start building the kingdom for him. Think about that this week. We're going to read through this. Next week, we're going to talk about another aspect of this. That when we enter in, it's going to have to, purification is going to have to take place. We're going to have to acknowledge that we all are sinful. Everybody in the sinful? sinful? That's another thing to being preached on TV. You a little God. Gee. 
made in the image of Jesus. You have no sin. I heard a guy on there, the other day say he hadn't sinned in five years. He just did. No, 12 years. Since God changed him, he hadn't sinned. Evidently, he's on another plane. Because I see him daily. If I ain't careful, the kids get jumping off the tables in the house. Lord help us. Lord. Lord help us. But God is going to call you to do something bigger than you. God's going to call our church to do great things in this community, guys. We are where we need to be to really impact you. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. As we end, I'm going to give us a chance to do something we ain't done in a while. We'll do an altar call. Don't touch each other. <laughs> but then the lights. And if you want to come up here and pray, there's plenty of square footage up here for you to pray. And it's been clean. The carpets have been clean. It's like the driven snow. So come on up if you want to come up as we begin to, yeah, Dylan begins to play. Come up and pray. Pray for our church, guys. Pray for, for these people and these families that are suffering right now. Our young Christians are suffering. We got guys that are suffering to walk. And as he plays, come and pray. Pray where God's going to use you. Where God's going to help you to, to grow into this next year. Because at the end of the day, who we were prior to all this, it doesn't matter no more. The things we carried through this storm, it, it, that don't matter anymore. Nickel came back to church prior to this, that don't matter anymore. Because God is changing our church into what He wants. Okay, let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day, Lord. We do thank you for this church. Thank you for continuing to bless it, Lord, and to make it a lighthouse in this community, Lord. Help us to be faithful, as Blake has said. Yes. We know you're under control. You're doing it all, Lord. You've kept us alive. And I see so many churches around us and different ones that I deal with, Lord, that doors are closed. They're not meeting. They're not being fed. Lord, just thank you for the opportunity we have to have Blake here and to have this church this building to be here, Lord. Thank you again for the opportunity you give us. Be with us, Lord. Continue to bless. In your precious name we pray. Amen.